So my name's Craig, and I'm a product engineer on the Living Atlas of the World team. I work with Keith. And what I do is look for interesting 3D data sets. Um, and Keith actually didn't make me look very far. He gave me this cool HiCom data set. And how do we use 3D to visualize it or better understand it? And I think HiCom is a great candidate because it's so deep and wide uh, in resolution uh, that it's easy to kind of miss what signals may, in, may be in there at depth. And so the work I'm doing is very closely related to some of the EMU work that was presented about three years ago here, but I'm just using a different data set. So whatever kind of lessons we've learned um, through this process, we can apply to other multidimensional data sets. So very quickly, the overall process is I'm going to be focusing on salinity and temp along with the U and V vectors uh, from HICOM. We define an AOI resolution, so in the EMU days, I think they used a quarter degree. Um, here we're starting at one degree global and then kind of going a little bit finer in certain areas of interest. We have this great depth range uh, down to 5,000 meters depth uh, at about 40 intervals and uh, a wide time window of 30 days in the past to about seven days in the future, but that uh, doesn't include a couple days of processing time. So I think we have five or six days maybe uh, future forecast. And so what I do is extract multivalues to points for each one of those dimensions, whether you're looking at the full stack of depth or uh, a certain time window. We 3 dfi the output. And so this involves, uh, in this example, kind of adding some vertical exaggeration because the data density is so uh, tight especially at the top, that we really need to stretch things out to be able to interact with the scene. Uh, then we apply some symbology, publish it to a web scene, and then you can go and interact with it. And so one of the differences between the EMU project and uh, some of this HICOM work, and this development uh, R&D project is only about a month old or so, so we're really kind of at the beginning, uh, but this seemed like a very good uh, place to get some feedback and, and interact with you guys. So let's go to the web scene. So some of these data layers I just published uh, this morning, so it's very hot and fresh, but uh, we'll take a look and see what we have here. So this is the HICOM data. Uh, this is just the surface level, so zero uh, depth, uh, showing temperature. We also have salinity, and again, for each one of these, you're just seeing the top level, so we have uh, many more depth intervals. It takes a little bit to load the first time here. So you can visually see some interesting patterns on the surface, but we want to kind of go and uh, take a little uh, trip underneath the sea. So I started with a one degree spacing. So I'm getting extracting point information at each one of these uh, sample locations. And as I said, we can go in a little bit deeper for certain areas of interest. So uh, looking at the straits around Denmark here, that's a little bit dark. Uh, there are you know, obviously some saltwater, freshwater patterns we may want to explore. And in this case, uh, this is a good time to demonstrate one of the new uh, capabilities of the scene viewer that just came out about a month, month and a half ago, the latest version anyway. And that is the ability to filter by attribute on the scene layer. So you can see I have a filter window here and some sliders. And so I've selected salinity. You can select any of the attributes associated with that scene layer. And we can interactively filter out certain uh, salinity values. So it's very um, uh, performant, uh, reacts immediately to uh, moving of these uh, sliders. So pretty cool capability. Let's move to, let's see, let's go to the Gulf of Mexico. So we have a little bit more depth here. Um, again, this is a 10 times vertical exaggeration. And as it loads up, we can see we have, this is the same one quarter degree spacing that we saw in uh, the EMU. And we can zoom in a little bit. And because we're exaggerated, it helps to have these little um, kind of measuring sticks, essentially, along the way. So this is 1,000 meters down. And you can see most of the temperature change is happening in those uh, upper pelagic zones, which is kind of interesting for a layman like me. But we're also getting the velocity and direction information. And so this is actually one week uh, time series. And this is just surface uh, velocity and temperature. So let me go to, uh, this is from the week of Dorian. And again, we can look at time series. So what's the cumulative or aggregate uh, movement of the water? And this is over a course of a week. And we can select one of these sliders so we can get eight time step, which is one day, and just move it through and see how the, uh, the arrows are, are sized based on velocity and pointed by direction. 
And if we expand the time series, we can see where there's the most variability over that uh, window. So we can see this is the Gulf Stream, very regular, very predictable. And as we go up to uh, closer to the shore, we can see more of a kind of a star pattern. And as we go a little bit closer, we can see we have this kind of bivariate uh, pattern. So we're going one way or we're going the other way. And if we, again, use the time slider, go down to back to one day, so we can slide it and we can see that as we move uh, through this week, it's slowly going from westward to eastward uh, movement. So lots of really cool things you can do uh, just with kind of time filtering and exploring. But if we hop across, here we can see Dorian, a lot more <laughs> active. So we can again slide in and get you know, a single snapshot uh, from Dorian at you know, halfway through this week. Uh, so each one of these we can click on, get some pop-up information about temperature salinity, and uh, kind of an interesting way to visualize that kind of data. Let's go to the equator. And this is where I'm looking at this as a layman. I'm not an ocean scientist. I'm not an atmospheric scientist. And so I wanted to look at different depth levels and what's happening you know, in maybe seven reasonable or interesting depths. So I did surface, 200 meters, uh, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000. So as I was exploring this, and again, I don't know anything, uh, I see that, OK, there's this one flow that's on the surface, you know, in these vortices, and then there's another flow that's just below the surface. And so how can I kind of you know, extract out these two different layers and look at them and compare them? So I'll go to my global uh, data set here. And again, filtering. This time I have my seven uh, Z levels. So I can grab this, bring it over to the end, and now I just see the surface uh, velocity. But if I move it a little bit over, here's at 200 meters. And so, you know, I'm looking online, I go to the Living Atlas, I'm getting the current directions, so I'm adding that to the map, kind of exploring what's going on here. Why is one way going, you know, this direction, the other way is going the other direction. So it ends up there's an equatorial undercurrent that is right along the equator. And this is something that I just kind of learned by exploring this map. So pretty cool. And so I published uh, this full you know, global data set at all depth levels. And you can use the same filtering capability to just pick out you know, what are the depths that are interesting and, and look at those a little bit closer. So while I was at it, I don't know anything about ocean. So I keep saying that. <laughs> so I made some little pop-ups to show you what the pelagic zone is uh, for each one of these depth levels, give you some little more information or context. So let's go back to the deck. So one of the things I learned was just the anchor location for a 3D symbol can make a big difference. So by default, you know, you have it centered on the, on the middle of the symbol, but you lose the ability to discern the direction. So when they're all stacked on top of each other, uh, if you're using the end anchor point, it's a lot easier to see uh, how that changes over depth, especially if there's an inflection point where uh, they're going in the opposite direction. So one of the things I've heard, and I talked to Keith about this, is a lot of people are kind of flummoxed or unclear about how to make an animation in Pro. So if you've seen some of the screens, there's spinning globes of HiCom data or salinity. And so I wanted to just kind of put together a quick video showing you how to make a, a kind of a spinning globe animation, which is good for global data sets. So let's go ahead and get started, and I'll just kind of annotate it. So the first thing we do is we're going to select our processing template. We're using HiCom here. And so when you use any of the Living Atlas HiCom layers, you have access to all these templates. Next, we want to set up our time uh, environment to match that of the HiCom uh, temporal um, uh, resolution. So that's every three hours. And so before we make an animation, we just want to get our time set up so that it's basically using all the data points along that span. So here we just test it. OK, good. Two different time steps. Next, we'll go in and set up the range. So this is the vertical depth range. And we may want to step through those values. Maybe we just want to do surface values over a certain time window. And so it's already plugged in. We just have to activate it. And now we see our full range from 0 to 5,000. So I always like to test, because I'm not sure if it's really working until you know, I plug in 200 meters and it changes. OK, good. 
and go back to the beginning. So now I want to set up some of the kind of environmental uh, illumination options. So I typically turn off the stars in Halo and turn on the atmospheric effects, uh, which of course gets rid of the space and stars. So we add a background of black. You could have it white too, doesn't really matter. So now we're getting closer. So let's start our animation. And we're actually just going to do kind of a test frame to get our camera position where we want it. So we want to do a spinning globe around the equator starting at 0, 0. And so in this single keyframe, now I'm applying kind of those values. And I want to do two globes next to each other. And so that means that I need the Z value of uh, 14 million. And so that'll frame it in a half a 1080p frame, essentially. So pitch 0, looking, or 90, minus 90, looking straight down. So now I can just copy paste, and I'll go back and forth between these two. And we can see, OK, we're in the location we want to be. Our keyframes are set up, our camera's set up. And so these are kind of serve their purpose. We get rid of them, and now we want to bring in the full-time series to do the animation. But wait, <laughs> before we do that, uh, we're going to remove anything that we don't care about as far as the animation is concerned. So this might be a base map uh, layer. It could be elevation. We don't really want Pro to be thinking about um, displaying those when we're uh, creating the animation. And so now we have our kind of simplified uh, globe with our HICOM data at zero. And we can bring in our time steps now. So first, we want to uh, check our append time. So for each one of those frames, it's going to spend that long in between uh, the next frame, essentially. So at 0.25 seconds, that's one day every two seconds in the HICOM uh, temporal resolution. So we brought in our time steps there, and we have 286 frames, essentially, pre-made for us. But they're all at 0, 0. So we want to be moving around the planet. And so we go at quarters. So 72 is about a quarter of uh, 286. And we're going to set that to 90 degrees, minus 90. So it's going to be rotating like the Earth rotates. Next, we'll go to the midpoint. So this is at minus 180, so this opposite side of the planet. And then we want one more point. So it's just basically just telling Pro which direction we want to go and kind of filling in the unknowns uh, for the full animation. So it's, I think, 215 or so. Yeah. So our keyframes are done. Uh, we have our kind of four set points. We can actually visualize that and make sure that we are uh, created the, the frames that we wanted and the, and the paths we wanted by turning on the paths and keyframes. We're going to zoom out a little bit. And now you can see kind of this path that the camera's going to take um, as the globe spins. Um, globe's not really spinning, we're spinning. So that done. Now we can turn off the path. And final thing is to add some uh, annotation. So we can do map time. So this is a dynamic annotation. It's going to show you what the current time step is. By default, it gives you the start and stop, but since we have an instantaneous single time, we'll just use the top one. By removing long, we're taking away the time, but we would probably want to keep that on here, just showing uh, how you can kind of edit the amount of detail in your time, time stamp. Always be sure to extend uh, the keyframes to the full range for your annotation, if you want it that way. And then we can use some of the presets uh, to set that dynamic annotation at the bottom or you know, use the arrows to move it down a little bit if it's overlapping. And that's it. So from here, export our movie. You can see I have a preset uh, 960 by 1080, so that's a half of a 1080 frame that I'm using. And now we can just export the movie. So I'm using MP4 here. So that's a very quick run through of, of creating a, um, an animation. These are the kind of general steps. Um, that we've already gone through. And so here's a sample of the animation on the left side that I just output. Um, again, I did another one at minus 100 meters on the right. Another approach you could take here is use the animation on the left, but maybe pick out a few different AOIs uh, from the globe and just have inset maps, maybe four, five, six on the right to kind of pick out the detail uh, where things are happening. So for example, move forward a little bit and see uh, yeah, a little system forming here. So maybe we'd want to add additional depth levels at that location. Same thing with this chlorophyll animation. This is monthly, so it's a little uh, longer time period. But same, same approach, same uh, methodology. 
So finally, uh, you don't have to just have spinning globes. Uh, I took that same Dorian time series and just animated it through uh, one week again. This is at three, uh, three hour time steps. That's a simplified path from Noah um, in the background there. It's almost reminded me of like starlings, you know, like the flocks of birds as they move around. So some of the challenges, wrapping up real quick, uh, the scene viewer, we're working with the scene viewer team in Zurich, um, as well as the pro team here on, you know, how much data can we publish? So the global all level data set at one degrees was, I think, um, 1.2 million. So if we add all the uh, time steps for a week, that gets up to 78 million. If we add, you know, uh, lower it to a quarter degree, then we're at 1.2 billion. Uh, points. So how do we manage that kind of data volume? How do we publish it? How do we keep a live service up that has that many features in it? Uh, filtering, uh, a lot of these things are available in the JavaScript API, but haven't come to the scene viewer yet. One of those is time filtering. Uh, and single value sliding, so basically clicking a single value and sliding through a, a range or a time series. Uh, cartography, I, I found myself going back and forth between uh, the ocean's base map and the dark gray. Um, so I'd like to see kind of a hybrid that gives you good contrast for your symbology, but um, also gives you the, the bathymetry uh, hill shade in the background. Uh, I had to create some custom 3D symbols because the out-of-the-box ones weren't quite up to scratch, uh, but in the future I talked to one of our devs and we will have a 3D symbol creator uh, in Pro uh, coming along. Just to make simple symbols with primitives and such. Uh, and work in progress right now is the actual data extraction process. So we want to automate that, and we want to create um, basically a web application where you can explore and filter and, and uh, look at these data sets. So that's it for me. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.